Um, I thought it was important to prepare some information for you to let you know the journey that, that we've traveled as a, as a school district um, over the past uh, two or three months as we're approaching the conclusion of last school year. It's been a, a very difficult time, obviously, for everyone, parents, um, employees, um, teachers, and, uh, and the community uh, as a whole going through the pandemic. So um, in advance of my presentation tonight, I'd like to thank all of the employees and the parents that we've spoken to over the past few months. Your input has been heard. Um, I, I conclude this presentation with a slide that says, there is no good solution in a pandemic. And that's certainly the case uh, with our plan tonight. It's, it's not a great solution, but it is one that I feel meets the needs of the majority of, of our students and parents. If the three of you would like to relocate, we have some seats back here, you can see, you okay where you are? Okay. So we start out as we do with all of our presentations with our mission statement, because everything we do should be focused on our mission statement. And that is uh, to educate all learners, maximizing the potential of each individual within the challenges of our global society. What we always focus on is that individual, you know, everything we do, we're trying to change our system so that we're not making our students fit our system. We're adapting our system to meet the needs of our students. And that's no different pre-pandemic, during the pandemic or post-pandemic. So bear with me here. <laughs> this is just a few of the major events that we've dealt with since the late spring. And May 19, or May 19th, CDC gave their initial guidance to schools. June 3rd, PDE released their preliminary guidance. And along with that was the phase reopening plan, which you've seen the first draft of and approved the first draft of, and we're bringing the second draft to you tonight. June 5th, Blair County entered the green phase. If you could remember, when there was hope. <laughs> you know, we thought we were coming out of it. Things were looking up. The number of cases were down. Businesses were beginning to reopen. The restrictions were being lifted. And there was optimism. And we were putting plans together at that time to return to a full traditional face-to-face -face setting. And on June 11th, we formed our pandemic crisis response team as required by PDE in relation to the phase reopening plan. That team consisted of teachers, administrators, board members, community members, and we consulted with nine of our local physicians who are also parents. June 15th, the initial return to school parent survey was launched and we we did receive an overwhelming response to that survey with 15, 1,550 responses. And we'll talk a little more detail about that a few slides down the road. From June 17th through July 8th, we developed our health and safety plan. We broke into seven subcommittees and those subcommittees prepared reports, which you saw in the plan last month and you'll review, you've reviewed again for tonight's meeting. And then things started to change a little bit. And that's what's made this so challenging because the target has been constantly shifting. July 1st, the Department of Health issued their first mask mandate. And this was after our phase reopening plan for the most part had been developed and it posed new challenges for schools. On the third, the Department of Health issued clarity on how that mask mandate would directly affect school districts. And that's where the six feet of social distancing came into play. July 9th, we issued our first teacher survey with over 200 responses to get the, the thoughts of the teachers. 
And again, things continue in Pennsylvania and Blair County to deteriorate regarding COVID. July 15th, you approved draft number one of our return to school plan, which was a, a full traditional face-to-face -face reopening. July 16th, PDE released guidance in the form of a blueprint for phase reopening of pre-K through 12 schools. And this is typical of the way things have happened. The, the reports have been required to be submitted and then guide, additional guidance comes out to kind of change the target. July 22nd, to, in response to the volume of questions we were receiving from parents and staff, we released our first FAQ. July 29th, because of the changing conditions, we decided to resurvey parents at the request of many parents who had changed their opinion on what they felt was the best option for the return to school. To date, we have had 1,839 responses, which accounts for an estimate of 90% of our students. August 6th, the return to school draft two plan was uploaded for board review. And as, as, as has been the pattern on August 10th, the Department of Health released COVID-19 early warning monitoring system, which I'll show you a little bit about in a few slides. So that's the main events that have transpired since uh, late spring. A lot has been happening and a lot of time has gone into the development of the initial plan and now the revised plan. So the June parent survey, the results, results were very encouraging. As I said, this was a different, a much different time. There was a lot of optimism. 1,550 responses, 90% of the parents who responded to the survey preferred to return in some shape or form to a face-to-face -face setting. Blair County COVID rate was low and Blair County was returning to the green phase. The economy was reopening. And at that time, there was no state mandate on masking or social distancing. And this is difficult to see, but the first three questions that we have here, I'd like my child to return to the traditional school setting and I have no concerns, 34 and a half percent. I would prefer that my child returned to school, but I do have concerns about exposure to coronavirus, 32%. I would allow my child to return to school, the school setting only after being assured that extra precautions are in place to prevent his or her exposure to potential health risks, 27.5%. Only 5.5% of our parents at that time indicated that they would prefer a virtual setting for one reason or another. Many of those parents, it was because of a pre-existing health condition with a child or with a family member. So of the parent choice options at that time that we had listed in our survey, traditional face-to-face, 95%. Only 65 of the parents responding expressed an interest in the Holidaysburg Cyber Academy and six of the responses expressed interest in homeschooling. And surprisingly, of the safety measures that had been discussed up to that point, only two, frequent hand washing and hand sanitizing and frequent cleaning of surfaces and common areas throughout the day had a majority of the parents feeling that that was a necessity to have in our schools as safety measures, 88%, 85%. Adults wearing protective masks at all times, 15%. Children wearing protective masks at all times, 11%. Children wearing protective masks when outside the classroom, 11%. So at that time, masks were not popular, as you can see. And again, remember this is mid-June. 
The results of the teacher survey were a bit different. Now remember the teacher survey went out a little later. That Now we're to the end of June where things started to change again. If Blair County were to remain in the green phase, what would be your preference regarding our return to school? 51% prefer to return to the traditional setting. 21% a hybrid setting. 16% start the year full virtual, and then the remaining percentage was uh, varying comments, many of which were not sure or with the th circumstances were different. So our health and safety plan, as I said, we developed it through late June into early July. We received input from families, parents, teachers, our solicitor, the return to school committee consisted of parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, healthcare providers as consultants. And I said, I think we had nine initially. And since then, three have provided input, three additional. Additional resources came from PDE, Department of Health, state professional organizations, PSBA, the School Boards Association, PASA, that's the Administrators Association, PASBO, Business Association. Blair County Superintendents, IU8, Blair County EMS, CDC. Three options were considered in the plan to return to school. The traditional face-to-face -face option, hybrid instruction, and full virtual. Highlights of draft number one of the return to school plan, which you approved in July. It was decided that the traditional face-to-face -face setting at that time was the best option. The option of HASD Cyber Academy was available for families who have indicated reservations of returning to school. Safety modifications for cleaning, social distancing, you know, you've, heard that, you've heard that before. So, as I said, that plan was approved July 15th and a lot has changed. There have been an increase in identified cases in the state and locally. Restrictions have been reimposed by the governor. I don't know if reimposed is a word, but Department of Health issued their mask mandate, as we refer to, which has a significant impact on schools. This order applies to any individual age two years and older, whenever outside the home, including while in school entities. Schools should provide, provide face covering breaks throughout the day, maintaining a distance of at least six feet during these face covering breaks. And it goes on to indicate the exceptions to when the mask can be removed. But it's important to note that that six feet, there's no gray area. Whereas at the start of the summer, it was directed to maximize social distance as much as possible. Now it was a, dire a directive or a mandate from the state. If you could not maintain six feet in any place in your school building, the children have to wear masks. So as I said, we issued the second parent choice survey because we were getting a lot of comments about changing opinions, both from parents and from staff. The second survey was initiated, we had 839 responses, as I noted, and we referred to it as the parent choice survey. We wanted them and we asked them to indicate when we return to school, what, where will your child be? So at that time, we still had 80, nearly 85% indicate that they still preferred the traditional setting. The cyber option had grown to nine and a half percent. And then a large chunk of the other comments were related to cyber or comments that they wanted to know more. They wanted more options. The inquiries for Cyber Academy, which I believe, I can't remember, call the number, it was in the 20s? 16? 65? 65 had, had grown to 400. Justin did a, um, a webinar, a webcast, and we had 400 people expressed interest in attending the webcast. And we, the responses to homeschooling, which I believe was six, had increased to 26. So 
people were beginning to get a little antsy and they were asking a lot of questions. <clears throat> this is the, a copy of the first page of the parent and staff survey. You can see down here in my screenshot, this is page one of 14. The survey, the first draft of the survey was, was uh, issued on the 22nd of July, the second draft just a few days ago. The staff survey is up to 14 pages. The parent survey is up to 10. So a lot of questions and a lot of concern. We also felt that it was necessary to establish a page on the website to collect all of the information that we've been sharing. Despite all that we've done, we're still getting comments from parents that they're being left in the dark. So everything that we've issued to parents, all of the letters are now in the HASD coronavirus resource site on the website. So we're doing everything we can to answer all of the questions and concerns that parents and staff have. There's a lot of anxiety. And we also started looking deeper into our plan. Now we're getting into the weeds. You know, are we going to be able to do this return to school with the additional mandates of, that have been implemented by the state? Are we going to be able to do this? So the custodians began laying out the rooms. This is a typical elementary classroom with the desks spaced six feet apart. <coughs> All other furniture is removed from the room. The teachers were directed to take home their personal belongings and any school furniture desks tables or additional desks tables bookshelves had to have been removed the only thing remaining is you can see here the teacher's desk with that being said in a traditional elementary classroom and i believe this is foot of 10 but frankstown's identical school with very similar size classrooms with six foot spacing we could fit 19 students and many of our classrooms, if not the overwhelming majority, we have more than 19 students. So I thought I'd show you, and I won't tell you the teacher's name, but this was a primary classroom prior to the organization. And you can see primary teachers in particular collect a lot of stuff. And you can see there's absolutely no way the way that that classroom was configured to show social distance. So those teachers were forced to take all of their personal belongings that they had gathered and used to deliver a quality instruction to their children, take that stuff, that extra stuff out of the classroom. Tables removed, individual desks, socially distanced apart, placed in the classrooms, even kindergarten. And this is a picture of the cafeteria. This gives you some indication of the detail that Jonathan Nyhart and Neil Edmiston and their crew went through to help their principals determine if they had enough space in the cafeteria for social distancing. If you can see, there are tape, tape marks placed on the tables that are distanced six feet apart. And they did that through the whole cafeteria to see how many kids they could fit socially distanced in a cafeteria. And this is a <coughs> this is a rare picture of Larry Detweiler, our foot of ten custodian, sitting down. He typically doesn't do that, but this is a picture of the cafeteria gymnasium. Typically, there's a divider. You can see it right here that separates two sides. One side's used for the cafeteria through the day, the other side is used for physical education class. We had to open up the divider and put every table we had in the gymnasium so that we were able to social distance the kids. And with that being done, the elementary principals would still have to use the art room, the music room, in order to get kids socially distanced. Another thing that we were looking at was that 
increasing number requesting the Cyber Academy, could we reallocate resources and use some of the teachers, 21 of whom have gone through human resource to request exemptions from working in the traditional environment because of health, health concerns? Can we reassign those teachers to instruct some of the kids that have requested, whose families have requested the Cyber Academy? The elementary principals did a distribution of those children who had expressed interest in the Cyber Academy to see if we had a group at a particular grade level where there were 18, 20 kids we could assign to that teacher. And then the rest of the kids would be equally distributed among the other teachers. But as you can see, or can't see, I apologize for this being so small. It was a pretty equal distribution. This is CW Longer, grades kindergarten through six, and the number of kids from families who've expressed interest in the Cyber Academy. Seven, six, seven, six, four, six, one. So not enough at any one particular grade level to reallocate a teacher resource to the instruction of those kids. Frankstown is a bigger school and Frankstown by grade level 13, 17, 12, 13, 17, 17, 19. So the numbers were getting closer at Frankstown, but still not enough to leave those other three teachers with 90 kids. That would be 30 kids in a class. Well, it would be a minus 19. So it'd be 71. But these are the things we did. Put a lot of thought into trying to develop some type of plan that would maximize our effectiveness. And after a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of feedback from parents, a lot of feedback from staff, we realized that there were significant roadblocks to the return to the traditional face-to-face -face setting. And I apologize, these are small. The inability to social distance, as I said, in the majority of our classrooms at, at both levels, elementary as well as secondary, we did not have the square footage to social distance the kids. Therefore, the kids would not be permitted to remove their face coverings. They would have to keep their masks on all day, with the exception of the cafeteria. <coughs> the inability to social distance in the lunchroom as I mentioned, requires expansion into gyms and at the secondary auditoriums, auditorium lobbies, and other large gathering areas. So effectively, we would have kids eating lunch all over the, the school building. And you may ask, why can't the kids just eat lunch in their rooms? The teacher contract requires us to give the teachers a half hour duty free lunch. That's, that's their half hour uh, break through the day. So I can't in my good conscience, require that teacher to monitor kids during their one half hour duty-free break. Increased interest in cyber options. I had said that 400, um, over 400 individuals showed an interest in our cyber academy if they were to follow through with that option and those parents enrolled those children in our cyber academy. We estimated that it would be a $1.2 million increase to our budget. And keep in mind, our sub cyber academy, we deliver instruction for less than half the cost of what it would cost one of our students to go to a cyber charter school. Cyber charter rates for a regular ed kid student is, is right around $11,000 for a regular ed student, $21,000 for a special ed student. We're thinking that we're instructing those children who are staying with us in our own cyber academy for between three and four thousand dollars. So that's a significant savings. Yet still, if four hundred go to our cyber academy, that's a significant increase to our budget. The lack of air conditioning, <coughs> and this is the big one, the lack of air conditioning in four of our five schools will not only increase the discomfort of wearing masks, but it could cause some health issues. I can't stand here and present to you for 20 minutes and keep my mask on. We're in an air conditioned room. I couldn't breathe. Imagine an eighth grade student sitting in a 90 degree classroom on the second or, floor, second or third floor of the junior high school, and then multiply that by, by eight for eight periods in the day. 
identified COVID cases among students and staff may, there's no guarantee, you know, we, we could go back to a face-to-face -face setting and no one, no one gets COVID or no one's exposed to someone in their family or in their close circle who has COVID. That could be a possibility. But identified COVID cases among students and staff may result in mass quarantining or even school closure as directed by the Department of Health. When we have a student who has a positive, who's been tested positive for COVID or a student who has a family member who's tested positive, we have to contact the Department of Health. Chances are the Department of Health will know before we will. And then we follow the directive of the Department of Health. The Department of Health will lead the contact tracing. We will cooperate and provide names of what we refer to as the cohort of contact for that student. We have to provide all of the names of the students who were in close proximity to that student. And then the Department of Health will tell us what we need to do. As I mentioned, we had 21, and now I believe Justin said, or Ben said 22 staff members who have requested ADA accommodations. A lack of teacher or staff availability due to COVID exposure. Right now, uh, the quarantine period is between 10 and 14 days. So with the problem we have with getting substitute teachers, what do we do with those students whose teacher has to self-quarantine? There, there was a time when we would take that class and put it in another classroom. We can't do that anymore because then we can we can no longer social distance. We have 40 kids in a class instead of 20. And a potential lack of bus drivers, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> many of our bus drivers are in that high risk category because of age or health issues. And we're already at a, at a shortage of bus drivers. So if we have no one to drive the buses, we can't get the kids to school. So these are all things that we uh, have been dealing with and have been trying to process over the past few weeks. And it was really becoming clear to us that it was gonna be really, really difficult to bring our kids back to a face-to-face -face setting. And then this week, the Department of Health released the COVID-19 early warning monitoring system. <clears throat> in response to school leaders' requests for additional guidance, and that's true. School superintendents wanted more directive from the Department of Health on how to interpret these statistics that we are getting regarding COVID. So as a result of that, <coughs> the Department of Health and the Department of Education provided recommendations, recommendations, not mandates, to K-12 schools to use when making decisions related to the instructional models used during the 2021 school year. The recommendations contained in this guidance rely on two standards of public health metrics. These are the two measures that they feel would be beneficial to school districts in making decisions as to the return to school. One is the incident incidence rate, and you've heard that on the news, how many identified cases are in the county and what the look back is, is the past seven days. So they're doing this in seven day increments. And the second measure is percent positivity of diagnosed cases. So of all the people who are tested in the county over that seven day period, how many tested positive? We have the website here where you, anyone can go to, to see this interactive uh, display. You can put in your county and all of the county percentages will, will come up, which you can't see. So here are two important charts that you take, you can take from this website. Difficult for you to see, but here's, here we have those two metrics that I just referred to. The incident rate, how many identified cases in the past seven days, and then the percentage positivity rate. If it's less than 10 <coughs> in that seven, seven day period, they're considering that a low community transmission, 10 to less than 100, moderate, more than 100, substantial. For percentages, less than 5% low, 5 to 10% moderate, more than 10% substantial. 
and just to put that in perspective, uh, Florida, who's been having a lot of issues over the past month, their positivity rate has been well over 10%. So for Blair County, unfortunately our incident rate, as you probably know, over the past two weeks has been increasing. Our percent, percentage positivity is still below 5%. I think it's climbed to close to three and a half percent, which I'll, I'll show you on the other graph. But that one positive above 10 puts us into the moderate range. And this graph explains that. This arrow shows that there's an increase in newly reported confirmed cases. The previous seven days, we had 41 new cases. The most recent seven day period, that increased to 60. The incident rate per 100,000 residents, still relatively low, the last seven day period of 33.5 and still relatively low, 49 comparative to uh, some other counties in the state, but increasing. And our percent positivity rate, still relatively low, 3.3%, but increasing to 3.5% over the last seven day look back. So that's what put us into the moderate, moderate range. And that is another contributing factor to our recommendation as administration to go to a hybrid, a hybrid approach. Another thing we have to take into consideration is the social emotional well-being. I had a conversation with a father earlier today who emphasized the importance of keeping these kids in school. His daughter, he admitted, has some uh, mental issues that she's dealing with, with depression and suicidal thoughts. And he said the socialization that school provides, the resources that we have in our schools is something that she absolutely needs. She really struggled in the spring to not have that. We are here because the likelihood is that we all have come from good homes, good supportive homes, and most of our children do, but we have a percentage of our children that don't. So we need to do what we can to keep those kids in school and not go to that full virtual setting where the kids will have no escape from that. So another contributing factor to the reason why we're recommending the hybrid option. Hybrid is any model in which the number of students in a school building is reduced by allowing social distancing of six feet to allow social distancing of six feet. This may be accomplished in many ways, including split schedule, schedules that rotate by day or week or similar approaches. This is what we're recommending for the Holidays Burg Area School District hybrid model. Students will be divided into two cohorts, cohort A and cohort B by alphabet. A through L and M through Z. In school attendance will follow a repeating five day pattern. The pattern that we chose was A, B, A, B, and then on Fridays it would alternate, the first week being A, the second week being B. A lot of school districts are choosing an AA virtual cleaning day on Wednesday, B, B pattern we didn't feel that that was the best pattern to choose because there could be the possibility that we would not see one group of kids for six days if it fell over the weekend. We also talked to John Nyhart and our physical plant uh, employees who felt that they do deep cleaning every evening. They disinfect the school every evening. So there's really no immediate need to take a day off between rotations to deep clean the school. By doing a cohort every day, we're increasing the amount of time our kids are in the school setting. What does this also allow? Here's, here's an example of the schedule, which I just explained. Accommodations will be made to ensure siblings are on the same schedule. So if you have siblings with different last names, they'll still be accommodated and put on the same schedule. Accommodations will be considered for special needs students. 
students who may be in a self-contained environment who cannot benefit at all from cyber instruction, accommodations will be made for those kids. Smaller class sizes will decrease the cohort of contact for students and staff and enable six feet of distance in all rooms and the removal of face coverings as permitted by the classroom teacher. So kids won't have to sit in that 90 degree classroom and keep their mask on. And we'll continue to follow the day one through six schedule. Here's a sample calendar. Again, my apologies, it's difficult to see. This whole presentation will be posted on the website tomorrow. For the end of August, our first day of school is August 26th. That will be a day one. Group A will be face-to-face, -face. group B will be virtual. Second day of school, the 22nd, 27th will be day two. Group B face-to-face, -face. group A virtual. And then we're proposing to move our September in-service day to Friday the 28th. So all students will have one day of school. Then we'll have an in-service day to evaluate the effectiveness, what went well, what didn't go well, and to give teachers further instruction on how to effectively teach in a hybrid environment. Sample student schedule. <coughs> this is Barb Dwyer. She's a 10th grader and she's on the A schedule. This is what her schedule will look like. Face-to-face -face Monday, virtual Tuesday, face-to-face -face Wednesday, virtual Thursday. First week of school, she'll be face-to-face. -face. Second Friday, she'll be virtual. The reason we chose that repeating pattern that will not change is to help our parents who need to get childcare. They can go to their childcare provider and tell them, my child's gonna need childcare on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and every other Friday. And here's gymnasium, first grader. He's on the B schedule. And he is the opposite of Barb virtual Monday, face-to-face, -face, virtual face-to-face. -face. So I end with this. This diagram pretty much sums up the process that we've gone through through the whole pandemic and every school district's gone through. We have accepted change, we've adapted, we've innovated, and we think that there's been a lot of improvement in our instructional delivery because of it. There is a silver lining and we will continue to grow. If the board is so kind as to approve our hybrid approach, that's gonna be new to us. And we're gonna to need to do professional development in order for it to be effective. But I feel confident our administrative team will lead our teachers through that. We have learned that there's no good option in a pandemic. Our goal is to choose the best plan possible to meet the diverse instructional and wellness needs of our students while considering the health of all. And that's what it's all about. So I asked the board to uh, consider our recommendation to a hybrid plan. It is not ideal and it's not gonna be easy. But after the past two months of the work we've put into this, we feel confident that right now with the circumstances the way they are, this is our best option. So we're open for questions. I have four administrators here for principals here to answer any questions you may have about the hybrid option or the issues that we've dealt with with a face-to-face. -face. My question is when you have a student who's listed as face-to-face -face and a student who is on the virtual side, is the virtual student expected to be online and Zooming at the same time that the class is happening? No, that's a great question. Lon is asking you, <laughs> Sorry. So the question was, will the students who are in the virtual setting in the hybrid plan be following along in the classroom? In other words, will every classroom be live streaming? And the answer to that is no, we don't, we don't have the bandwidth to live stream. But the way that we're envisioning is this is that the teacher will plan out a full week of instruction. And then that teacher will prioritize those instructional concepts that need to be delivered by the teacher in a face-to-face -face setting. 
and then the additional content that they need to go through will be designed and planned so that the student can do that in the virtual setting. And then when they come back the next day, which that's the advantage, they're only out for one day, not for two, not for four, not for five. Then when they come back the next day, the teacher will assess and move the student forward according to how well they're acquiring those concepts. One thing that has to happen, and this is something we've been emphasizing for years, is differentiating the classroom. There was a time, probably when we were in school, where the teacher stood at the front of the room and had delivered instruction at the same tempo in the same way to every student, regardless, regardless of how they learned or how quickly they learned. Well, we now know that we have to change our instruction to meet the needs of the individual. And this hybrid setting is going to force that. It's going to be very evident if we have a teacher that's not doing that. Thank you. This is Mr. Brenneman. Um, I have a question about the um, what I believe is the AB, ABA, um, uh, what, what we've decided uh, to do. Have we talked about the AA, BB, um, I guess it would be then the AA uh, way to, uh, to to schedule the uh, the time that the students would be in in the classroom. Um, is, is there a benefit to having the students at, at, at the AA so they basically have two days um, together in the classroom, and then the next group would have uh, two uh, that next group uh, two days uh, together. Um, I, I'm sure you, you've thought this through, and I'm just interested in understanding what made us choose the ABAB versus AABB, if, if I'm articulating that well. Thank Hi, you. Bob. This is Maureen. Um, come up this mic. Bob, this yeah, is this Maureen. Is Bob asked me to answer the question. I don't think I need a mic. Maybe I'm just louder than Bob. Can you hear me, Scott? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, the reason why was mainly we have, you know, children in the special education program or any children, it would be very difficult to go from if you, we do AABB and then, you know, some weeks, because if we were AABB and then a B week, you would go from Tuesday to Monday before you saw a teacher. And that is extremely difficult. Or, you know, if we're in, in the same thing with the students on Wednesday, if we were um, A, A, B, B, and then A that week, they would go from Wednesday until the next week before they were actually in front of a teacher and had interaction with the teacher. So that was the main reason why that we um, thought that the A, B, A, B schedule was the best. Okay. So it's it's articulating or you're, you're basically to... Um, to maximize the 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 time that a, a student would be able to, uh, I guess, reduce uh, that that time that they're not with a, with a um, a teacher, uh, that, so they would they'd be able to, to do that more more quickly, I guess, frequently. make that interaction yeah. more frequently. Yeah, thank you. Right, and because some students, you know, they don't not all students learn well virtually. So therefore, going that long and not having to be able to talk to somebody or, hey, can you review this with me? Can you teach this to me? That, that's a really long period of time for some kiddos. Okay, thank, thank you. Well, is there any way to go with this plan and come out of it and go five days a week? How would that yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's our hope. You know, our hope is that things will continue to improve in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and Blair County specifically. And, um, and, you know, Blair County can reopen, you know, the, the colors that were originally the green, yellow, red, that that's gone. You know, we've been told that the governor, that was, that was such a negative PR thing that the governor's abandoned that. So it's not going to be affected by what color we are. But if we see a pattern over, and it's not going to be, you know, two days, 48 hours, but if we see a pattern over two seven-day periods or two weeks where things are improving and we're in a hybrid plan and there's no spread and we're not dealing with, um, with, with um, spread of COVID, then 
then definitely that's where we want to be. We want to be in the face-to-face -face setting. We know that's where parents want to be. We know that's where our teachers want to be. You know, Dr. Letcher had a, an orientation, was a 10th grade orientation. Yeah. And she was giddy the next day because she got to see kids. And the, our teachers are the same way. They miss the kids as much as the kids miss being in the school. So we want them here five days a week face to face, but it would be very irresponsible of us to go to a face to face plan considering the circumstances now, because I think that would increase the chances of us going, going back to full virtual, which we know that's, that's not where we want to be. Uh, my question kind of piggybacks on Lana's question. The virtual days, will they be required to at least log in at a structured schedule like period one, period two, to keep them in that routine day to day? Well, and that's a good question. Uh, the virtual, even if we were to go, like we're hybrid right now, and, and those hybrid days, those virtual days and hybrid are going to be look very different than what, what we had in the spring because we know, you know, and, and someone made the reference that. In the spring, that was cyber light, you know, because we, we really took it slow, took it easy on. We just wanted to get them through the year. And it was not completely effective. So we know that those virtual days in our hybrid setting are going to look very different. Exactly what that looks like, I don't know. But we know it's going to look very different. And we know if we were to go back to virtual, we were forced to go back to virtual, that it's going to look very different. And that's based on the parent feedback from the parent survey that we issued in uh, part of that parent survey in June. The parents, we asked the parents to reflect on what went well, what didn't go well with a, with the um, virtual setting. We got some great feedback and we did the same with our teachers right. and the teachers gave some great feedback. So it's going to be much better based on that feedback we got, but I can't tell you exactly what that hybrid of a model is going to look like. I mean, we're going to be building that over the next two weeks if the board approves our plan. As a parent of a teenager in particularly, I recommend if you have to have even the hybrid, the virtual days be structured into periods just to keep it consistent from day to day. So it forces them to get on and do their work and, you know, be accountable. You know, because believe some it. Parents aren't home to make their kid do that. <laughs> well, that, and believe it or not, one of the biggest issues that we had, and Dr. Letcher, you can comment on this, and, and Ms. Dobrovolsky, uh, to a, a smaller degree, one of the biggest issues we had with our secondary students in the spring when we were in a full virtual setting was that a lot of them worked during the day. A lot of them took oh. jobs. Okay. And then they were doing their work at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And the teachers were doing their best, you know, but teachers are adults and adults go to bed at a decent hour. You know, that wasn't that, that was a big issue, wasn't it? It was, and I think that that just showed how our teachers, how flexible they are and we had to accommodate. Right. Because the students wanted to work. They wanted to have jobs. Many of them were in co op and picked up a, a lot more hours because they were off. So we just need to be flexible in this setting and accommodate what's best for each individual child. So those are, the, those are the factors we have to look at. We got to, we have to look at all that and come up with a plan that's that's really going to be effective. Another way to look at that, Nicole, maybe too, just something to consider, like we do with our kids that are already in the cyber platform. It's more about number of hours per week as right. opposed to an actual schedule. Right. It might be a better. Well, way then, to I I have two kids. Yep. One would do amazing in the cyber program. The other one would fail miserably. <laughs> it would not work well at all just because they're not set up. And so I understand, like, like she said, everyone, every kid is different and has different right. needs. I just think that structure of the schedule is important. Any other, anything else? Any questions? Well, Bob, I, I have a question. Yes. Um, would there be any way to help utilize some of those teachers who want to do virtual um, in providing office hours for like synchronous um, learning on an off day? You know, maybe just one class or maybe, um, I guess it wouldn't be a study hall, but it would kind of be like a, maybe a work session where kids could still have 
interaction with a teacher. If there's a problem, maybe we could be alerted to help them just so they have a lifeline to the school, but wouldn't have to necessarily be an all day thing. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. And that, that might be something that we consider as we develop the details to this plan because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're gonna look at all possibilities. That's, that's one that I didn't consider. Did you think of that? We did, and part of that is obviously via email, but also just like when we were in the virtual setting in the spring, um, teachers often set up individual sessions with students that reached out and asked for them. And it would be the same type of thing. And teachers have prep periods. Um, that's important. And, and you know, they, they um, have some free time uh, sometimes during the day. So that, that would be a way if they see, and, so, and many of our teachers have tutoring sessions after school. So that would be a time also that they could do a live session if a student, like you said, needed a lifeline when they were actually um, home for, for the virtual. Yeah. yeah, even if it wasn't that their particular teacher, just having somebody in there that they could talk to or they could bounce ideas off of, um, just a thought, I thought that might be helpful. Absolutely, and we definitely need to set up support systems in place for our students when they're not here and when they are here. So that's a great suggestion. Bob, this is uh, Mr. Nichols. What brought us to this point from July 15th from a uh, face to face to a hybrid when we're one of the lowest death rates, infection rates in the state? And, and going off CDC's own guidelines, uh, just for an example, H1N1 is five to 10 times deadlier than COVID and almost no children are getting COVID. So I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around why did we change from July 15th till now to a hybrid when we have six deaths, I believe, in Blair County as today, as of today. Yeah, and Manny, we, we don't even, deaths is not, death is not something that we're even considering. I mean, that's, uh, not, even, that's not something, I, I think my PowerPoint made it very clear how we got from, July 15th to now. And, you know, it, it's, we're watching the research just like everyone else is and trying not to be influenced by, you know, biased news media at, at either end of the spectrum. But um, there was just a report released recently, you know, it, it has been said through many studies that kids are not as susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, and that, that very well may be true, but there was a report uh, just released by the CDC recently that the last two weeks in July, 97,000 kids were identified positive for COVID-19. Now their symptoms, they were either asymptomatic, they had no symptoms, or they had very mild symptoms. But those kids that are testing positive go back to homes and again, Research seems to indicate that they're, the younger kids in particular are not spreading this disease, this uh, virus as much as adults, but now they're thinking that the older kids may very well be. So really all we're doing is trying to protect our community, our kids, our staff, and design an approach that is appropriate for where we are right now now and we don't have all the answers but we have to do everything we can to protect those people that that um, we're put in charge of so that's how we got here from july to now yeah that yeah my question was bob it's not just about death rate but infection rate and it wasn't from from a news media it was from cdc so that's what i was trying to get at what we what changed in the last i guess it'd be three weeks with the you know people's testing positive because they're testing more people but i just don't see why we jumped the hybrid so quick i don't see it in numbers is what I'm oh saying. it is there and and it's a combination of the increase in the numbers even though they may be low still low in blair county they did increase but even more so the mandates that as, as my, my PowerPoint indicated, the mandates that are currently in place 
I can't justify putting uh, eight-year-old kids in masks all day in 85 to 90 degree classrooms. It's, it's just, you know, it, it, it's against everything that I believe in as an educator. So what was our plan in July 15th? We were going to have them wear masks in the classroom. But well, in the if you can remember from my, my presentation, when the, the guidelines were initially released by the state, <clears throat> social distancing to the greatest extent possible. So we knew that we could get all of the kids in that classroom at four, four and a half feet apart, and we can let them take their masks off. And then the mandates came out. And the mandates were that it had to be six feet and the kids had to be separated if, if it wasn't six feet and they had to be masked. So the, the, the mandates changed, the requirements changed, and therefore everything that we had in our plan had to change. I have another question. Um, how will this hybrid plan affect uh, the VOTEC kids? And as far as transportation and their schooling, what do we know about what's going to happen to them? We've been meeting, this is Maureen again, Melissa. We've been meeting with um, the Blair County secondary principals every Wednesday. And um, Mike is the principal over there. He is following the plan of the home school. So whatever days the GACTC students come into school, um, those are the days that they will go to the GACTC. Um, he did talk today about he may have one day where he doesn't have students come in, one day a week to give his teachers an opportunity to um, kind of set up some of the virtual for the days the students aren't in there. But they've been very flexible and they're following uh, whatever schedule that the, the sending schools are following. So whatever students are in front of his teachers that day are the students that the teachers will teach plus they'll have a virtual platform for each of their areas of study. Thank you Maureen and are we also going to continue to transport those students um, because of the parking restrict you know the restrictions over at the GACTC? Um, Absolutely we're even adding more buses um, so that the buses aren't quite as full as they have been in the past. Mr. Caldwell has added more buses for us going into the CTC, but yes, they will be transported just like they are in normal schooling with whatever stu the students that are here, they'll be taken in and then come back here and um, finish their day here at the uh, senior high and the ninth graders at the junior high. Thank you. Just one this more. Is Scott. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Scott. It's fine. Okay. Um, just very quickly, and, and this is um, maybe just a, a statement rather than a question. I just, uh, I, I just ask that as uh, as we put this plan together, um, that that we we keep in mind, uh, as uh, Dr. Gilday has already said a couple of times, just how hot those uh, so, some of those um, places are where where the kids are are going to to be. Um, to be taking doing their schooling and I, I just want to make sure that you know if there are other options uh, you know whether it's fans or um, I, you know AC is is not not likely you know in the, in the next in the next couple of weeks or, or what have you but um, I just ask that uh, that that we keep in mind um, all of those other potential options that, that we have to keep to keep things um, cool for the kids uh, and and reduce that um, that sort of burden for them as, as much as possible in um, in those those um, those places. So, thank you. My question is: I'm asking something about what I don't know, but you had said that um, virtual students would not be able to call into the classroom or be part of the zooming because of bandwidth. Would um, telephone calls does that take bandwidth again? I'm talking about what I don't know, but could they call in and and hear audio of what's going on in the classroom? There's only one line going into the classroom, so if you have one 
phone call in from only one student. You can only handle one phone call oh. from one student. Okay. Right. Let me let me ask you this though. When we were virtual, we did some synchronous learning. So we're not saying when we say we don't have the ability to live stream, that doesn't mean that they can't do, you know, a, a section of their less live stream uh, via their Google Classroom as a part of their lesson, or you know, do some type of other collaborative activity. They can still do that stuff, right? Okay. I think what, what it was, was that, you know, the thought was, can we do live streaming in every classroom? And Justin said, no, we, you know, simultaneously, we cannot do that. I think that's the concept that we were, we were getting at. If we were to go to hybrid, everybody can't live stream at the same time. Okay. Now, what I understand is A goes in, the teacher teaches A, half the other class comes in, they're B. So the teacher's actually teaching the same thing twice. Yes. So to set up a a virtual thing they're going to be watching the same thing again right. but i would assume right. that the teacher's giving a some work that continue right. on yeah, to until they the come concept. back in right i would think to extend this, the concept so you think you know for for mathematics like uh fractions you know you may introduce the concept of fractions to group a and then give them you know work uh to to build on that concept give them a project where they have to use fractions to you know some something like that and then when group b comes in teach the same lesson again and then when group a comes back build upon what they had learned not only in the face-to-face -face, but also in that virtual yeah see we're not at the point where they're teaching two different things they right. if they teach a a they have to teach the same thing or right. it's going to be so b will always be a day behind a not necessarily. Well, it depends One on how. Examples an English teacher used, and I think it's perfect. It's the students in front of them, they'll, teach, they'll do the reading comprehension lesson, and the students that are home will work on vocabulary and grammar. So it's not that they're behind, they just might be working on something a little bit differently, but they're all moving ahead in the curriculum. But, you know, whether they're, you would just work on what, when they're in front of you, things that need more explaining and give them more independent work when they are at home. Okay. And so I think the way to think about it as well is when you talked about prioritizing the curriculum, it is about determining what are concepts and skills that are best taught in a face-to-face -face environment that require direct instruction for students that's learning. Then there are other follow-up activities or things that are more appropriate to be done um, as a guided practice or independent that students could be doing related to that concept that they're directly getting taught so as to maximize the amount of time that we actually are face to face with students. I have another question. Is there, <laughs> I'm full of them today, is there the ability at the junior high to possibly say the teacher has a lecture that they don't necessarily need their board are they able to take the kids out on the lawn and do their lesson out there in the fresh air and sunshine, like on a nice day? Uh, can we utilize the courtyard here? I mean, there's a lot of grassy areas around our buildings. Yes, absolutely. So this is Lydia, junior high principal. We're offering that to the teachers. We have a lot of space, as you mentioned. Um, the junior high is very hot. Um, I know our custodial staff and myself have experienced that this summer. Um, so any opportunity we can give to the kids to be outside with the teacher in a safe area, um, we'll definitely support that because that's going to be wanted by everyone in the building, but it's also giving those kids an opportunity to focus on learning rather than focus on being so warm. Right. Mm -hmm. And they can utilize like the auditorium for class time yes. and such. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I have three things that I would like to ask. First, I'd like you to rehearse a typical day off to school. The time that a kid leaves his home and gets to the bus stop or and he's waiting there with other kids. Uh, when does our responsibility pick up? As soon as he steps on the bus or is it at the uh, at the school stop and then rehearse the day. In other words, he would keep that mask on all through his bus ride, all through the time of coming into the building. And the only time that they could remove that mask is when they're at their safe spot in their six by six 
uh, corral. <laughs> and then when the school is over, uh, they know to put masks back on. And when they can step outside that barrier, then there's school the whole time. That would be the one thing I'd like to see make rehearsed. And then the second thing is who enforces all this stuff and uh, who can jump one of the kids that doesn't bother them to, to, or 10 of the kids that don't bother to do this. And uh, thirdly, after school activities with different organizations that you have within the school is there are there mandates that apply to them in this same uh, setting. I know it's a long thing, but tomorrow I'm going to be asked by a lot of people a lot of questions, and I'd like to just have that. Yeah, the first thing I'd like to say is we're not going to jump anyone. <laughs> I want to get that. I want to get that out of the way first. So we're not going to jump anyone. But the responsibility begins at the bus stop. You know, the you know it, it's it's less about uh, you know uh, punishment and punitive, and more about just staying healthy. You know, so. The expectation, if you're close, if you're the only one standing at your bus stop, there's no need for you to have a mask on. But if there's other kids there and you're talking with them and you're within, you know, two or three feet of them, of course, we expect you to have a mask on. And we anticipate that we're not going to, still not going to be able to maintain social distancing on the bus. So, yeah, the expectation is that you'll need to have your mask on on the bus, walking into the school. Then once you get into your classroom with a hybrid setting, we'll be able to social distance and you can relax a little bit and take your mask off, provided the teacher, you know, gives the blessing for that. We're going to, and this is, a, you know, a term that's used by our solicitor, we're going to engage in the interactive process with kids that um, either refuse to wear a mask or say they have a medical reason why they do not have a mask on. And that's going to be initiated by the principals, the building principals. So they're gonna engage in that process with the student, with the student's parents. And Dr. Letcher did a great job. I don't know if any of you saw her interview on WTAJ. She did a great job addressing that question. Would you like to share any of your thoughts with that? Because that, that's tough. Right, it is. And it's not about dumping a student or yelling at a student or disciplining a student. It's more about we're gonna educate them talk to them and sit down with them and say, hey, you know, what's going on? We'll have masks available. Maybe they just forgot it. I mean, that, that's very much the, the numerous times I've walked out the door and been like, oh, my mask, and, you know, I have some extra ones stuck in my car just in case. So that that's part of it. It's more about educating the students. And we do have a protocol in place if it happens to be um, an issue of defiance and for the safety of other people. But a lot of that's going to be with communicating with the students and with the parents and calling the parents and saying, hey, could you help us out here? Do you want to come in and talk? So it's going to be more taking those steps um, before discipline action is taken. Good. Sorry, can I ask a couple <laughs> questions? <laughs> you know, that's not what you want to hear right now. Um, I'm just curious at the elementary level, I know under the face-to-face -face plan, the idea was that the students would stay in the classroom and the teachers would rotate. Is that no longer going to be the case if we go to a hybrid model, or how is that going to work? Okay. Actually, it was still the same. We stay the same. Rotate. Although, I can't say that will happen in every case because there are circumstances where teachers have to work in the classroom setting that they're in based on needs or air conditioning purposes and things like that. Okay. So, really, the students will travel as a cohort. So, in most cases, they will remain in the same room. If there is a need for, uh, you know, because if we, like in fifth and sixth grade, where we do math and ELA, sure. those teachers will rotate into the students. The students will remain as a cohort, unless it's not feasibly possible that the students will have to, just like they do with the junior high and senior high, look throughout the hall, line up, desk up, and you can go one direction, the other kids go the other direction. Okay. That kind of thing. So that part of the process really will not change. It's just going to be fewer students in the classroom. Correct. Yeah, the goal is still to, uh, as much as possible, to reduce the cohort of contact of each student. So to reduce the number of other students that they come in contact with. At the elementary, we're able to control that a little more than we are at the, at the secondary. Will you, then, will you then, sorry, will you then organize your homerooms based on the ELA level? Uh, so that, that I'm sorry, I'm sorry, so that, so that kids that are on the same level that would normally be in the same ELA class 
are in the same home room. Home room basis, which will be your EDL and your non complexer. All right, I'm calling it a modified heterogeneous grouping of students because there are groups of students that we have um, obviously placed together at home room base because Title I teachers, special needs teachers, gifted support will come to one classroom, a whole group of students from that room. So we spend a lot of time organizing children into groups, but overall, they're heterogeneous. Okay, thank you. And the senior high is the same? Like, are they doing nine periods or are they doing those four periods? Eight periods, yes. We're doing eight periods, the normal schedule that we okay. have done. Um, no, you know, all the students are doing. <laughs> we, we tried. We tried to look at ways to reduce and do block scheduling. It just, we just couldn't get it to work out. Yeah, that sounds better. And, and the, I guess the last thing I want to say is more of a statement than a, than a question. Um, if we go to that um, hybrid setting, something I really encourage all the administrators and, and teachers to think about as you're designing the instruction, everything's going to happen twice. And especially the kids, until the until the schedule shifts a little bit, the kids on the B day will be at an advantage because they can talk to the kids that already had the A day. And so, I mean, I'm sure that's occurred to you already, but just it opens up a whole new can of worms for kids to collude and take advantage of the system and those kinds of things. It's spoken so, like a true teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It's just always there. Yeah. An A so, exam and a B exam. Right, yeah. So I just I really hope you're thinking through those lenses as you plan all that out. Yeah. I have another question. Um, I've been asked by several parents. Um, they are interested in knowing what kind of training and education and extra support we're providing for our teachers that will help them succeed and help our kiddos in this kind of model. That's a great question. And that's one of the reasons why we um, have the calendar on the agenda for tonight because right now the schedule has two in-service days at the start of the school year and we're proposing uh, pending board approval that we add an additional in-service day as i said on that friday of that first week so that we'll have three in-service days to do some pd and i'll i'll turn it over to uh mrs mitchell to give further detail on that or to address that yeah so that was the plan um as far as knowing that teachers may need additional support looking at it at a different um, way of doing business they had opportunity to work in a virtual setting um, and were asked very quickly to to do that um, starting in march um, all teachers across the state were asked to do that so um, i think we're learning from what we previously did um, and also figuring out ways to do it better and then the plan is for those in service days, obviously we cannot gather in large groups. Um, so we plan on using building based opportunities for departments, for grade levels to be able to get together to work. And we talked about that prioritizing. Um, there are a few things that we need to cover and do, but primarily the first several days will be about giving the teachers time to do the work that's necessary um, to be prepared and, and to get ready. Um, obviously, um, Google Classroom is something that we will be utilizing. Um, I know that they've spent a great deal of time with training and PD along those lines, but obviously we'd still want to differentiate that for staff who still feel they might need support in some of those areas. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Those are great questions that you had asked.